privilege for me to introduce today our President Emeritus, Dr. Don Campbell. He received the Bachelor's of Arts in History from Wheaton College, where he graduated with highest honors. His THM and his THD were earned here at Dallas Seminary. He received the Lorraine Chafer Award in Systematic Theology as a graduating senior. And he's been honored both from Liberty University and Dallas Baptist University with honorary doctorates since earning his own. Before joining our faculty, he taught at the Dallas Bible Institute, was chairman of the department and assistant professor of Bible and philosophy at Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee until 1954. Since 1954, he has held almost every office you could hold at Dallas Seminary. <laughs> he was registrar, he was assistant professor and professor of Bible exposition. He was the acting chairman of the Bible exposition department. He was the academic dean, then the executive vice president, the vice president and chairman of the faculty, then president from 1986 to 1994. And since 1994, he has served us as president emeritus. <laughs> He serves on numerous boards for evangelical ministries and schools, has served as a pastor, been a sought-after conference speaker since 1949. He's authored a number of books and scholarly reviews. His first wife, B, of 44 years, went home to be with the Lord in 1991. And uh, through that marriage, he has uh, four adult children and nine grandchildren. And then he remarried in 1992 to Levon, which was his former wife's sister. And that was fun. <laughs> and they share from her marriage, her marriage before her husband uh, departed this earth, three adult children and three grandchildren. So he has a, a beautifully blended family, children, grandchildren, and uh, knows both sides of the family, at least of two sisters. <laughs> We who have known both of them love that, and it has uh, been a great set of relationships. But Dr. Campbell, we love you. We thank you for your encouragement and the long history of investment so that uh, we stand here today and we sit here today uh, in, uh, in due much to your leadership over the years. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Let's welcome our President America. <laughs> Inevitably, one of my faculty colleagues and friends will say to me, as recently as the day before yesterday, uh, Don, you're looking good. Uh, I don't know what they expect. But, uh, <laughs> glad to hear those words, except that uh, there are three stages in life, youth, middle age, and my, you're looking good. <laughs> but I guess that's better than the fourth stage. Doesn't he look natural? Open your Bibles. Uh, you do have Bibles with you, of course. Psalm 46. If I could reach the victims of Katrina, I would say, open your Bible, read Psalm 46. Over and over and over. It has a message for you. Martin Luther, whose hymn we sang this morning, loved the Psalms. He studied them relentlessly. He taught them. He preached them. During some of the dark days of the Reformation, uh, Luther got discouraged and battled depression. And on some discouraging days, 
he would say to his friend and associate Philip Melanchthon, Philip, come here. Let's sing Psalm 46. And out of that, of course, came a mighty fortress is our God. James Boyce quotes Luther. We sing this psalm to the praise of God because God is with us and powerfully and miraculously preserves and defends his church and his word against all fanatical spirits, against the gates of hell, against the implacable hatred of the devil, and against all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and sin. Psalm 46 tells us of some grievous national danger, some attack against Jerusalem by heathen invaders, some great deliverance that came through the mercy and power of God. Well, this national crisis is not specifically identified in the psalm. Some Bible scholars suggest that it was the invasion of Sennacherib into Israel, 701 BC. He came, he surrounded Jerusalem. Jerusalem was besieged. And Hezekiah the king tried to buy in his, their escape uh, by paying tribute. Isaiah the prophet said, God will deliver the city. And God did. One night, God sent an angel, and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were slain. One angel, one night, 185,000. And God miraculously delivered the city. And I can imagine that Jerusalem just rang with with hymns of praise to God. And the suggestion is that Hezekiah, on that occasion, penned Psalm 46. Whenever disaster strikes, God's people turn to Psalm 46, which assures us that Regardless of the tragedy, God can cope and God will deliver. There are, it seems to me, three pictures, three vignettes, if you please, in the psalm. We have a picture of, of, of nature and, and the calamities of nature. And we are so familiar with the fact that uh, storms can wreak terrible havoc in our world. The calamities of nature is the first picture or vignette. The second one is of a city under siege, and that is the city of Jerusalem. And the third picture is of a battlefield that is, is strewn with the wreckage of war. Uh, let's look at these three pictures. First, uh, God's power over nature, God's presence in the face of calamity. God emphatically, God Perhaps only God is our refuge, our shelter, our strength, our inner strength, our help, 
our ever-present help in trouble. Derek Kidner says, we never know or realize how close God is until we are in trouble. He is our bridge over troubled waters. And the response of the psalmist to this uh, declaration of God as our, our refuge, our inner strength, our ever-present help is found in verse 2 and, and 3. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, or NIV has, though the earth should give way, it, it seemed to Hezekiah that it was the end of the world for him and his people in Jerusalem. But we will not fear, though the earth should give way, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters, the waters of the sea, roar and foam, though the earthquakes, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. These great convulsions of nature, uh, even the earth and the mountains, which seem impregnable, Though, though the earth moves and, and the mountains quake and, and the sea, which is so frightening, boils up, yet we will not fear because God is our shelter. He is our inner strength. He is our help. The second vignette uh, pictures the besieged city, uh, pictures Jerusalem under siege, and demonstrates God's power over Jerusalem's enemies, verses 4 to 7. In these four verses, God is referred to seven times. He's in every verse. For in that time of deep distress, Hezekiah says, if he wrote this, God is our resource. God is our help. And he is present Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. What does that mean? Because Jerusalem doesn't have any rivers. It, it has reservoirs uh, to collect rainwater. It, it has conduits that bring water brought water from the, the ancient so-called pools of Solomon south of Jerusalem. Oh, it had the Gihon Spring, uh, which in the earliest days of the city was probably its only water source. And Hezekiah uh, anticipating the coming threat from the Assyrians had his engineers beginning at opposite points build or carve out, excavate a tunnel through the rock that would bring the water from the Gihon Spring into the city to the Pool of Siloam. 
1,777 feet. It was a marvel of engineering that they, the workers met within four feet of each other. In 1982, I think it was, Stan, Dr. Toussaint and I led a group of 15 students to a three-week study program in Israel. What an experience. What an experience to be Dr. Toussaint's roommate for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> he would say the same thing. We had a great time. One afternoon, I led some of those, the bravest souls, through this tunnel. It was dark. Water up to our ankles, up to our knees, up to our waists. I had a small flashlight. And to raise the spirits of these students, we sang, all hail the power of Jesus' name, <laughs> the seminary hymn. But I don't think that's the reference here to the river that makes glad the city of God. I think it's a symbolic, figurative language for God himself who refreshed the city, who, who, who brought joy, who brought security to the city of Jerusalem. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Is that a reference uh, veiled perhaps to uh, what the residents of Jerusalem discovered one dawn, one morning, when they looked out and saw 185,000 corpses? Perhaps. God will help her when morning dawns. The, the nations made an uproar. Or could this be a reference specifically to the, the nation, the empire of Assyria and its siege of Jerusalem? But in the face of that, the kingdoms tottered. Jerusalem quaked with fear. He, God, raised his voice. God spoke. The earth melted. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So, from the rage of nature to the rage of man, the siege of the city. But God was there. Seven times in four verses, God was there. As in the time of trouble, God is with us. Jesus said, I'll be with you to the end of the age. And Hebrews 13, the writer said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He's with us in the storms of life. The third vignette picture, God's power over all warring nations. And... The scene is, is a, a battlefield that is littered with the, the aftermath of, of conflict. In my, in my judgment, it, it's an eschatological scene, for the language carries us beyond this immediate incident. Verse 8 to 11, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow 
cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with the fire. Come, behold the works of the Lord. He summons the people to, to witness the intervention of God in Jerusalem when Jerusalem was delivered. In history, Jerusalem has not always been delivered. Uh, God was present with them. The prophet Ezekiel describes the sad departure of the Lord from the city of Jerusalem because of its sin. And in 586, Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And in AD 7, the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. God did not deliver. But the day is coming when once again Jerusalem will be delivered in Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, the prophet said the Lord will gather all the nations against Jerusalem and then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. And Jerusalem will be delivered. And in that day, his feet, Christ's feet, will stand on the Mount of Olives. The last part of verse 5, I love this expression. Then the Lord, oh my God, that the prophet is all but overcome. Then the Lord, oh my God, will come and all the holy ones with him to deliver his people in Jerusalem. Revelation 19 describes, behold, I, I see heaven opened and the Messiah coming, seated on a white horse to judge and make war. So Jerusalem, at the second coming of Christ, his return to the earth, once again, Jerusalem will be delivered. So this is a word to turbulent nations. Beware of the fact that God will make wars to cease. Verse 10, verse 10. Cease striving, says New American Standard. Cease striving for what? For supremacy in the earth. Nations aspire to that. And know that I am God. I will be exalted. I will be exalted in the earth. That's the word to troubled nations. Turbulent nations. But it's also a word by a strong application to turbulent, troubled hearts. And I do prefer the translation, be still and know that I am God. Twenty, three years ago, 22 years ago, I was in a hospital bed awaiting open heart surgery the next morning, which was not all that common in those days. And my wife had gone home. The room was dark. I turned on the bed lamp, reached over, picked up the Bible, opened it up, put my finger on a verse. I had taught my students in hermeneutics never to treat the Bible that way. <laughs> but I faced a crisis. There was some uncertainty of what was going to happen the next day. I confess some fear. 
a, a, a troubled heart. And the verse I selected was, be still and know that I am God. I'm capable of handling this situation. After the surgery was passed and my wife and I were able to converse, she told me she went home that night, opened her Bible, read Psalm 46, and claimed this verse, be still and know that I When John Wesley died, he had nearly lost his voice and just re regained a bit of it. And he suddenly called out, the best of all is God is with us. A friend of mine, was in the office of a, a mission organization in Colorado Springs. He saw a motto on the wall, for this I have Christ. He wrote it down. A couple of days later, a friend called. The wife of uh, a young couple they knew well. Fine Christian couple, four uh, children. They were financially secure. Uh, they were active and alert Christians. And suddenly, the doctor told her she had a severe, debilitating, ultimately fatal disease. My friend said, listen, I saw this plaque, it said, for this I have Christ. She said, just a minute, I want to write that down. Wrote it on a three by five card, put it on the door of the refrigerator. For this I have Christ. My young friends, the storms of life will come. Memorize this word. For this I have Christ. He is our ever present help in trouble. So Father, thank you for your word to ancient Jerusalem and to us. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the fact that you are our shelter. You are our inner strength. You are our present help. We rely on you. We trust you, our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.